Now, first, let's go over the chronology a little bit. We've been on the air all night here at Columbia's news headquarters in New York. The uh, we started at 12:37 Eastern War Time when the German news agency Transocean broadcast that the Allied invasion had begun. That is 37 minutes past midnight, New York time, and that's when we began our broadcasts. We uh, came on the air about every 15 minutes, as I recall. It seems like a long time ago at that point, giving you the uh, stories which were coming out of Europe very slowly, all put out by the Germans. And we continued our programs and continued uh, to uh, in not interrupt our, broadcast, our regular programs, but we continued to come on about every 15 minutes or a half hour with a news broadcast. Then at 3 o'clock in the morning, New York time, we started this particular broadcast, which has never stopped, because 32 minutes after we started it and were still discussing the reports which were coming out of Germany, suddenly we got the word to switch to London. Colonel Dupuy of the United States Army read communique number one, and the invasion had begun officially. Now, let's go over this chronology just a little bit. I'm sure that while a number of you must have been with us all night on this broadcast, still there are others who are now getting up and uh, who are joining us and who perhaps haven't heard that the invasion has begun. The liberation of the continent of Europe has started. So let's go over the chronology briefly. At 12.37 in the morning, 37 minutes past midnight Eastern War Time, Transocean, a German news agency, broadcast the Allied invasion had begun. At 1 o'clock in the morning, Eastern War Time, the DNB agency broadcast that the French harbor, or port rather, the French port of Le Havre was being bombarded violently and that German naval craft were fighting Allied landing craft off the coast. Nearly an hour later, at 1.56 in the morning, all times Eastern War Time, Calais Radio, controlled by the Germans, Calais Radio said, this is D-Day. At 2.31 in the morning, a spokesman from General Eisenhower broadcast from London to warn the people of the European invasion coast that a new phase of the Allied air offensive had begun and ordered them to move 22 miles inland. We still didn't know that the invasion had begun. The Germans were saying so, but the spokesman from General Eisenhower's headquarters in London at that time at 2.31 said to the people of Europe, a new phase of the Allied air offensive has begun, move 22 miles away from the coast. At 3.29 in the morning... Eastern War Time, Berlin Radio said the first center of gravity is Ka, that is C-A-E-N, the big city at the base of the Normandy Peninsula. And then, three minutes later, at 3.32 in the morning, Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force announced the communique number one in one sentence, Allied armies have begun landing on the northern coast of France. That was followed eight minutes later at 3.40 by the announcement from Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force that General Sir Bernard Montgomery was in command of the assault army comprising Americans, British, and Canadians. That's a bit of the chronology so far. It's very sketchy. A bulletin has just been handed me, so I'll give you that at the moment. It comes from Chafe, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, just announces that United States battleships are supporting the Allied landings in France and United States Coast Guard units also are participating in the operations. American Marines are in the fighting and are manning secondary guns aboard the big ships. Uh, we've been getting some uh, reports, you know. People pick up reports from the uh, German radio and uh, pass them along, and we give them to you for what they're worth. This one is certainly not like that. This is a statement from Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force. It's very late, so I'll repeat it for you. Schaeff has just announced that United States battleships are supporting the Allied landings in France, and United States Coast Guard units are participating in the operations, and American Marines are in the fighting also and are manning secondary guns aboard, aboard the big ships. Here's a statement from General Pershing, who commanded American armies in France in the First World War. General Pershing in Washington said, and this is a quotation from here on, American troops have landed in Western Europe. As the overmastering military might of the Allies advances, it will be joined by the men of the occupied countries whose land has been overrun by the enemy, but whose spirit remains unconquered. Twenty-six years ago, American soldiers, in cooperation with their allies, 
were locked in mortal combat with the German enemy. Their march of victory was never halted until the enemy laid down his arms in defeat. This is what General Pershing says, and I continue. The American soldier of 1917 to 1918, fighting in a war of liberation, wrote by his deeds one of the most glorious pages of military history. Today, the sons of American soldiers of 1917-1918 are engaged in a like war of liberation. It is their task to bring freedom to peoples who have been enslaved. And General Pershing finished his statement by saying, I have every confidence that they, together with their gallant brothers in arms, will win through to victory. And that's the statement which General John J. Pershing, the commander of the American armies in France in the First World War, has issued in Washington. It's uh, interesting to note one thing in particular in General Pershing's statement. He specifically points out that the march of the Allied troops to victory in 1918 was not halted until the German army laid down its arms in defeat. You know that Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party, uh, when they came to power in Germany and even before, one of their uh, main uh, points of propaganda was that the German army had never been defeated, but that the German home front had betrayed the army in 1918 by quitting the war while the army still wanted to fight. In this statement from General Pershing in Washington, D.C., General Pershing takes the trouble to point out once again that Adolf Hitler was not telling the truth and that the German army was certainly defeated in 1918, laid down its arms willingly, and quit the fight. It's interesting to notice also that in a speech... We've been monitoring the, I'm sorry to interrupt, we've been monitoring the BBC overseas broadcast and understand they have a program on the air, and so for that we take you now quickly to London. These 26 words. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. It was announced soon after this communique that General Montgomery was in charge of the army group carrying out the assault. This army group includes British, Canadian and United States forces. Correspondents at Supreme Headquarters say the landings were in Normandy and they took place between 6 o'clock and a quarter past 8. Airborne landings have also been carried out in addition to those made from the sea. Minesweepers swept away into the coast. Battleships, monitors, and cruisers carried out long-range bombardments of German coastal defense batteries, while destroyers and special coastal forces of the landing craft type bombarded the batteries and beach defenses from nearer the shore. Both the Royal Navy and the United States Navy supplied the landing craft. About half the smaller types of the British landing craft were manned and commanded by men of the Royal Marines, and some of the infantry carrying ships through the Red Ensign of the British Merchant Navy. Correspondents at Supreme Headquarters say the naval aspect of the operation is predominantly British. Of the normal types of warships employed, the proportion is about three British to one American. The overall proportion, including landing craft, is about three British ships to two American ships. American battleships and United States naval aircraft are taking part. Transport routes across northern France were pounded throughout the night. Dutch Mitchells and Royal Air Force, Polish and Australian Mosquitoes of the RAF's second tactical air force concentrated their attacks on roads, railways and bridges, embankments, cuttings and junctions, and other points in the transport network over a huge area where traffic blocks would be a nuisance to the enemy. There was a large amount of cloud over France, and a number of the Mitchells came back without bombing. The mosquitoes nearly all found their targets, and pilots reported successful attacks on a convoy, rail and road junctions, and parked vehicles. RAF Bostons were engaged in smoke-laying operations in the English Channel. Observers on the coast say that activity during the night was on, on an unprecedented scale, and here in London there was a constant stream of aircraft overhead. The offensive has continued since dawn and people on the coast have seen particularly strong formations of fighters flying out towards Dieppe. Strong forces of bombers are also reported to have crossed the east coast this morning, and there was great fighter activity. 
The German overseas news agency has been issuing frequent reports about the Allied landings. These say that the combined landing operations encompass the entire coastal sector between Le Havre and Cherbourg, that reinforcements were landed at dawn, and that several battleships are shelling the shore to cover waves of landing craft. Berlin reports that the area of Caen appears to be the first focal point in the fighting, and that in this area, German troops are in fierce combat with British and American units landed from the air and the sea. Caen, capital of the department of Calvados, stands on the river Ong, about 10 miles inland behind the flat coast. His Majesty the King will broadcast this evening at 19 hours Greenwich Mean Time, that is at 9 p.m. double British summer time. General de Gaulle has arrived in England. He will broadcast a message to the French people later today. That is the end of this news bulletin from the BBC London. This is London calling. Back again at Columbia's news headquarters in New York. We were just going along filling you in with the uh, special reference to uh, you of our audience who have just joined us, who have not heard about the invasion, who are just turning on your radios this morning. We were just going along, as I say, filling you in when we got quick word that uh, the BBC was putting on a British news broadcast which might be of interest to you, and so we made a very rapid speech, a rapid switch. My eye fell on the word speech in uh, something that I was just about to give you, and that's why I said speech instead of switch. What I was saying before we did uh, bring in the BBC was that it's interesting to see that in a speech which made no reference to invasion, but was delivered in the certain knowledge that the hour of climax finally had come, the President of the United States last night told the nation that victory over Germany is certain, but he said, quote, it will be tough and it will be costly. To many radio listeners here in the, in the United States last night, it seemed that President Roosevelt was extraordinarily preoccupied and that his comment on the accomplishments in Italy was designed more to point them up as a prelude to what was to come than to extol the victory already won in Italy. Having in mind the fact that Berlin and Tokyo remain as Axis capitals, he summed up the capture of the uh, Italian capital of Rome by saying, one up and two to go. A great many of you undoubtedly heard the speech of the president last night. And incidentally, that reference uh, to that reference in the dispatch from Washington I was just giving you to Tokyo reminds me that before we realized that the invasion actually had begun, before the official word came from the Allied headquarters in England, when we were broadcasting here last night the uh, German reports, one bit of copy came over the United Press wires. I was reading it right off the machine to you, saying, San Francisco, the Tokyo radio has said nothing at all about the German reports of invasion. That was the first and last time that the capital of Japan was heard from during uh, this somewhat confused evening of broadcasting. And as it happened a long time ago, about 2.30 in the morning, Eastern wartime, I thought I might bring it up once again. Tokyo at that time said nothing. Tokyo has still said nothing as far as I know. If we do get word that the Japanese have made some comment upon the beginning of the liberation of the continent of Europe, we shall certainly pass it along to you as quickly as we can get it. Now, I hope that the broadcasts will not sound too repetitious from about this point on. We've had uh, a very busy night of broadcasting. Everything was, uh, as soon as we started in our New York headquarters, we were interrupted frequently because we had word that something was coming from England, which we could bring you directly, and uh, so we were going along pretty rapidly. But now our audience is being augmented constantly by people who are waking up to start the day and who have not heard all the news. And so uh, from time to time, as we stay on the air here at Columbia's news headquarters in New York, we shall be repeating uh, the most important details to fill in those people those of our audience who are just coming in and who don't know what has happened. Perhaps you missed the first two official documents announcing officially the start of the Allied invasion of France. The first communique was one sentence long. It said, Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces supported by strong air forces began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. That was the text of communique number one. It was read at Supreme Headquarters in England by the United States Army's Colonel Dupuis, and we carried 
the broadcast of Colonel Dupuis reading that communique at 3.32 in the morning New York time. Moments later, it was announced from Great Britain that the British General Sir Bernard Montgomery is in charge of the attack. Perhaps you missed also General Eisenhower's order of the day. That was the next broadcast we got from London soon after uh, the communique. Edward R. Murrow, Columbia's chief correspondent in Great Britain, read the text of General Eisenhower's order of the day. Here are some excerpts from that order. General Eisenhower said, Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon a great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you, and the hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, and he will fight savagely. But, the order from General Eisenhower ended, the tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together, and we shall accept nothing less than full victory. And that, in brief, is the order of the day which General Eisenhower issued to his troops and which was broadcast shortly after communique number one. We have not had communique number two, incidentally. Communique number one, that one-sentence communique, is the only real official statement of the fighting that has come from the headquarters so far from Great Britain. Of course, we've had further details, but only the one communique. We heard, you know, that United States battleships are taking part in uh, are part of uh, the naval force, and also United States Coast Guard units are there taking part in the landings in the, or somewhere on the coast of northern France, and we heard also that American Marines are in the fighting and are manning secondary guns aboard the big ships. A few moments ago, in the BBC News broadcast, perhaps you heard the British announcer giving you a few further details. He mentioned the American forces who were there and also told us something about the Royal Marines of Great Britain and uh, the ships flying the Red Duster, the Red Ensign, which means that they're British merchant ships who are also taking part in the landing operations. Now, at this point, 11 minutes past 6 o'clock in the morning, Eastern War Time in New York, Major George Fielding Elliott, Columbia's military analyst, has come back into our studio. He has some more military news for us, and so I now hand the microphone over to Major Elliott. We've just had a story which has come in on the wire from Washington uh, by uh, Sander S. Klein, United Press staff correspondent, and... Uh, it tells of an American sergeant packing concentrated destruction who peered into the darkness toward France and said, they can't stop us. His four words from an invasion front dispatched to the War Department were uttered as the greatest military operation of history began, very quietly and without tension, from a small British town whose inhabitants had little idea that anything unusual was going on. From this town, the War Department dispatch said, the liberation of Nazi Europe began in a small way as assault troops, believed, uh, relieved of practically everything but weapons, walked calmly aboard their blunt-nosed landing craft without attracting the slightest bit of attention. Of course, when they say began in a small way, the dispatch means that these were the first small assault detachments that, going, that are going ashore to clear the way for the larger forces are coming behind. This is not a small operation, but it emphasizes the fact that the first detachments that go ashore are not very large ones and have to be built up into the great armies that will presently sweep forward into Europe. Thus started what in a matter of hours became a roaring, flaming, crashing inferno, the War Department dispatch continues, as the battle was joined on the northern coast of France and Allied airplanes formed against any targets, however small, which might have a bearing on the strength of the army. The men had been briefed carefully. They knew exactly what their mission was. At the last moment, the War Department dispatch said they were relieved of practically everything except their arms and ammunition. An officer explained to them, you are going to have a nice holiday by the seaside. You won't have any KP or fatigue details or training or anything. Just relax. A headquarters report described each man as a walking arsenal. Some carried their Garand rifles, 80 rounds of ammunition, and three grenades. Others bore grenade launching Springfields, and others had Browning automatic rifles. The faithful 
old weapon of the last war, which is still doing excellent service in this one. Then there were bazookas and flamethrowers, TNT pole charges, and all the other equipment necessary to reduce fortified positions. The sergeant who said, they can't stop us, added, we've got more firepower than anybody ever heard of before. Another sergeant thought it was a pity that they should take away the men's overcoats before the last minute. On reflection, he added, maybe this is the last minute. It was. The men were equipped with other things besides their weapons. They had been taught, for example, to say in German, halt, put up your hand. And in French, which way is the Bosch? The assault units were assembled, not in divisions, regiments, battalions, or any of the other large military units, but in craft loads. Before the landing, these craft loads were assembled so that the men would drive on the beaches in their normal tactical formation. For the first day of operations, each soldier was issued one day emergency ration. Tomorrow, the War Department said they will be served hot food from field kitchens in France. And as an old soldier, I can tell you that that means a lot of very careful planning by the staff departments, the supply people who must be behind and who must take care of the troops all the way forward. And if they don't do their job, the troops are in a serious spot. But this has one of these operations which has all the earmarks of the most careful and thorough planning, and we can be very sure that those boys are going to get that hot food just as it has been promised to them. For a week before the invasion, the troops had been kept close to quarters in the marshalling towns, forbidden to talk to civilians or to any soldiers who were as yet unbriefed. When the time came to jump off, they were ready. Overhead streamed warplanes covering the operation. Targets for the Ninth Air Force's Mustangs, Thunderbolts, and Lightning, the War Department dispatch goes on, were concentrated in a relatively narrow but important urban area of northern France and Belgium, crisscrossed with roads and rail lines from Germany, leading to the first line of pillboxes and trenches dotted with strategic air bases and cities. No target is too small, the dispatch said. Still employing the present tense, the headquarters report added, but the Ninth Air Force is now flying more fighter-bomber missions with more aircraft than any air force in history. And thus, that useful plane, the fighter-bomber, the uh, plane of all work of the tactical air force, is again in operation, doing its work, supporting the ground troops, knocking out enemy resistance, blasting enemy columns as they move on the road, stopping a movement of enemy reserves as they come up to attack our men, and in general, providing that invaluable cover to our ground forces, which is the Air Force's main task in supporting the first waves of an invasion. While these small units are still fighting their way ashore, while they're still likely to be outnumbered at a particular point by enemy ground troops, it is the job of the Air Force to cover them and protect them and to give them that support without which they could not hope to accomplish their mission. And now, here once again, is Bob Trout. We've been listening to Columbia's military analyst, Major George Fielding Elliott, broadcasting from our Columbia News headquarters here in New York City. The morning is very bright now in New York. It's only 17 minutes past 6 in New York, Eastern War Time, but the morning does seem to be well advanced. The sun is high in the sky, and uh, while speaking about New York's waking up, you will probably want to know how New York's famous Times Square reacted to the news that the invasion has at last begun, the news which came in in the middle of last night and uh, which we have been broadcasting constantly since it did come in. The news of the invasion was received with calm in Times Square. There were relatively few people, mostly a few servicemen, on the streets at that early hour. Here and there, groups of servicemen and civilians collected around taxi cabs and listened to radio reports of the landings on the coast of France. There were no demonstrations at all. About 25 persons gathered in front of a newsreel theater on Broadway at 4 o'clock in the morning when a radio loudspeaker blared forth the latest bulletins, and for all we know, perhaps that loudspeaker is blaring forth my voice at this moment. In other parts of the city, householders were up and at their radios. We could see scattered lights in apartment houses from out of the Columbia windows here in our news headquarters, 
and uh, watchers, I might say, along Upper Broadway reported that scattered lights were seen all over town. At the Bendix Aviation Corporation Marine Division plant in Brooklyn, 500 swing shift workers gave a spontaneous cheer when the news was received, but the management said the workers remained at their jobs and not a second was lost. A scene that was probably typical of that in many public places here in New York was enacted at an east side restaurant where about 20 diners rose and listened with bowed heads as the first reports were broadcast on a radio in the restaurant. Mayor F.H. LaGuardia of New York was told of the invasion by police, and he called upon the people of the city to carry on at their jobs to give the men in the invasion forces their utmost support. Mayor LaGuardia announced plans for a mass prayer meeting at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime in Madison Square, where the eternal light, a memorial for the soldiers of the First World War, is burning. Police here in New York said that along Broadway, excitement aroused by the Allied announcement of the invasion had been somewhat tempered by the previous German reports which spread through the nightclub belt shortly after midnight. As a matter of fact, I uh, came down to Columbia's news headquarters here in New York about 1.30 in the morning New York time in a taxi cab. The taxi cab driver told me that the Germans had broadcast that the invasion had started, but he advised me not to believe it until there was confirmation or some sort of word from the Allied headquarters. He said that the Germans were saying there was an invasion, but that didn't mean there was, and that was a very good attitude, I thought. It's one which uh, we can all be proud of because uh, we were being very cautious here at Columbia and in all American newsrooms until the word came from Shafe, from Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force in Great Britain. As long as it was just a matter of the Germans saying the invasion had begun, we were being very careful indeed. But this time, it was true. Most of the churches throughout the city of New York will be open today for special D-Day services. All Episcopal churches will be open, we've been informed. And at Trinity Church, the famous church in Manhattan, observances will be held every hour around the clock all through the day. And a number of war plants in this New York area will also hold special prayer services. Uh, that's uh, the way New York took the news of the invasion. That's the way New York has taken it up to this moment. At about 21 minutes past 6 o'clock in the morning, New York time, there'll be further reports of how New York received the news as the city wakes up, and there will undoubtedly be further reports, which we shall give you from other cities and places in the country, telling us how the rest of the United States received the news that at last the liberation of the continent of Europe has started. Here's an Associated Press dispatch, which has just come in. It's from Wes Gallagher, and he datelines it, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. We might as well get used to the word shape. The AP dispatch from Wes Gallagher says, In this military Shangri-La, cleverly hidden from snooping German spy planes, the war's greatest secret was hatched early this year. Adolf Hitler would have squandered the lives of ten divisions and much of his wealth to have learned this secret even up to a few hours ago. But today he was given it free of charge, and it may cost him his life and power eventually. The secret, of course, was D-Day H-Hour. D-Day, as you probably all know by now, was the military terminology for the day of the great Allied attack, and D-Day was Monday. H-Hour was the exact hour British, Canadian, and American soldiers were expected to set foot on the soil of Western Europe. Hard supply, necessities, and the complications of modern amphibious warfare made it necessary that these two factors be known to the staff officers months in advance. The dates were set for the arrival of troops, guns, and tanks in Great Britain. The dates for air attacks on specific objectives. Dates for establishing bases. Dates for the capture of key ports. And Mr. Gallagher reminds us in his Associated Press dispatch that dates are not figures on the calendar. They're scheduled in terminology that goes like this, D plus 5 or D minus 6. The first means five days after the troops land. The second means six days before the day for attack. Hundreds of thousands of lives depended on a successful D-Day choice, and if the weather was bad and the water rough, thousands of soldiers might be drowned in the treacherous surfs of the European coast. It was too light at night. If it was too light at night, the convoys might be broken up and the soldiers landed on the wrong beaches. And Mr. Gallagher's dispatch ends, if the tides were wrong, the ships might be stranded 
or any one of a hundred things might go amiss if the date had not been figured out very carefully in advance. And now we've just had word that we're to hear further news direct from overseas. And so for another report of the pool broadcasts, we take you now to London for the report of CBS correspondent Charles Shaw. Go ahead, London. This is Charles Shaw in London. For an hour after the broadcast of Communique No. 1, I played town crier to a London generally unaware that France had been invaded. I rode and walked through the Strand, Fleet Street, past St. Paul's, along the Thames Embankment to the Houses of Parliament and Westminster Abbey, up to Piccadilly Circus and other parts of so-called downtown London, asking people here and there what they thought of the news. In most cases, I found out that I had to report the news before getting any comment. It looked like London any morning between 9.30 and 10.30. The streets comparatively deserted, soldiers of all nations ambling about, street cleaners running their brushes along the curbs. I asked a taxi driver to take me around the city because I wanted to see how people were reacting to the news. Incidentally, I asked him, have you heard the news? I heard something about it, he said, but I don't know whether it's official. I assured him it was because I had just returned from the studio where the communique was broadcast. Waiting for a traffic light, we drew alongside a car driven by a girl wearing the uniform of France. I leaned out and said, what do you think of the news? What news, she asked. The Allies have landed in France. All she said was, thank God. Fleet Street, headquarters of the press in London, was normal. A couple of men who might have been reporters were seen dashing into buildings. And up to St. Paul's Cathedral to see whether there were worshippers inside. And the only person in the vast auditorium was a black-robed guide to the crypt who hadn't heard the news. His comment after being informed was, that's good. And so it was all over London. Two RAF sergeants were sightseeing in Westminster Abbey. A couple of women were trying unsuccessfully to gain entrance to the Houses of Parliament. Downing Street was empty, except for a street cleaner almost in front of Number 10. All over London, Women were selling flags for the benefit of the Red Cross. The girl I patronized hadn't heard the news, and her expression changed little when she was informed. The next interviewee was a roly-poly woman, just about as broad as she was long, who had heard the broadcast. It's good, she said. Not a newspaper extra appeared on the street. London, this morning, for at least an hour after the broadcast of Communique No. 1, was the same London that it was yesterday morning. Earlier this morning, the telephone rang at 7 a.m. It was Ed Murrow. He said, better get dressed and wait for a call from me. A new world speed record for getting dressed was promptly set. The dressing was accomplished against the background of heavy sky noise, the sound of great fleets of planes. They were too high to be seen, but their roar seemed to fill the sky, and the planes seemed to be everywhere. At 7.45, the phone rang again. Get to such and such a building as quickly as possible. It was the building from which the big communique was to be issued. It was going to work time for London, and masses of shop girls and businessmen jammed the sidewalks leading to that building. Almost bursting with what I felt was the big secret, I studied the faces of those people. Their expressions were the same as those of going to work people all over the world. Most of them looked sleepy. Quite a few of the girls were white-lipped, apparently having got up too late to put on lipstick and intending to do so at their offices. Some were neatly dressed. Others had ties askew, just like the 8 o'clock crowd in Pittsburgh or San Francisco. But there was one difference. The clothes they, were, they wore neatly or carelessly were mostly of 1939 and 1940 vintage. The lipstick the girls wore or forgot to wear 
was of a hard, chalky substance, war stuff. The tiredness in their faces came not from a bad night, but from almost five years of working in the front lines of war. You felt like shouting to those weary people, it's happened, the invasion has started. Because that's what these people have been working and fighting for. Fighting beside anti-aircraft guns, fighting with fire hoses, fighting with industrial tools. Since one day almost exactly four years ago, when the tattered fugitives from Dunkirk reached these shores. In a few hours, they would know, and you wondered how they would take it. The building was reached, and the way correspondents were converging on the gates from all directions reminded you of the old Tunerville trolley animated cartoons in which an incomprehensible number of people would enter small apertures. They were all hurrying. Some of them just moved their legs faster without seeming to cover much more ground. Practically every pass that you'd been issued since arriving in London had to be produced. No one-eyed Connollys could get in here. Bureau chiefs were herded into one big room. One person from each press association, major newspaper, and broadcasting network. All others were barred. And downstairs, outside of new special studios, the other broadcasters were waiting and typing out last-minute pieces. And one of those studios had been locked tightly since its construction was completed. That was the studio from which the communique was to be read to a waiting world. Already, the German radio was broadcasting reports of fighting in France. London was maintaining silence. The broadcaster's workroom was filling with colonels, majors, lieutenants, and GIs of both the American and British armies. Nobody seemed quite sure of what so many soldiers were supposed to do in so small a room. White-legged, white-belted MPs, their garrison caps banded with what looked like white bandages, took stations inside and outside the doors. In came the official Allied spokesman with retinue. He began calling New York Network headquarters, informing them that the first communique would be broadcast at 9.32 London time. 9.32 arrived. The communique was broadcast. The big secret was out. This is Charles Shaw in London returning you to New York. Columbia's news headquarters in New York once again. Bob Trout speaking. We've been listening to another one of the pool broadcasts. And uh, just in case that word might mystify you a bit, perhaps I can explain that uh, this broadcast by our correspondent Charles Shaw in London is one of the many broadcasts being put out now from the Supreme Headquarters in Great Britain and available to the combined Allied radio networks. We just heard Mr. Shaw explain how our Columbia London staff, Edward R. Murrow, and uh, he himself, Charles Shaw, started to handle the invasion news as it began to come out last night. Uh, Richard Hotlett, another member of our Columbia London staff, uh, was with the Air Force. He made a trip in a marauder, and uh, he came back, and his broadcast was heard some hours ago as he described uh, what he had seen as he made the trip in the marauder over the enemy coast. And now we have some uh, fresh news coming in on the ticker. Prime Minister Winston Churchill went before the House of Commons today and told the crowded House that an immense Allied armada of 4,000 ships with several thousand smaller craft have carried Allied forces across the Channel for the invasion of Europe. Prime Minister Churchill says that Allied commanders have reported that so far the invasion is proceeding according to plan. That is the very latest news. It comes to us from London telling us that Prime Minister Churchill has told Commons the Allied armada which carried uh, the troops across the channel, consisted of 4,000 ships, several thousand smaller craft, and that so far Allied commanders report to him, Mr. Churchill, that the invasion, the liberation of the continent, is proceeding according to plan. That's the very latest from London. The story is coming in in a form that we call here in the newsroom a running story. Perhaps there will be further details of what Mr. Churchill actually said in a few moments. But now it is time once again to pause for station identification. If our audience will bear with me and permit me, I should like to explain very carefully again to the staffs of our Columbia-affiliated stations around the country. We are continuing this invasion coverage broadcast, and we are going to pause very briefly for station identification. We're not ending the broadcast at all. We want them all to be back with us in exactly 15 seconds. The pause will be exactly 15 seconds. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Columbia's news headquarters in New York once again. Bob Trout speaking. We're continuing our coverage of the invasion of Europe. And I think that it would be a good idea to start now as we resume after that pause for station identification. It's a good idea to resume by repeat, repeating to you the brief bulletin that came in telling us all we know to date of what Prime Minister Churchill said before the House of Commons today. Mr. Winston Churchill went into the House of Commons, told the House that the Allied Armada, which carried the invasion force across the Channel to Europe, consisted of 4,000 ships and several thousand small boats. And Mr. Churchill then said that the Allied commanders have reported that so far the invasion is proceeding according to plan. Mr. Churchill said... A series of landings in force on the European continent occurred during the night and in the early morning hours. A thousand first-line planes can be drawn upon by the Allied attacking forces as need be for the purposes of battle. Now, those are the quotations from Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and even as I speak to you, there are additions uh, being brought in and put down on this desk, and I shall continue as uh, they are brought in. The very next line says... Churchill also said that massed airborne landings have been successfully effected behind the German lines. Massed airborne landings successfully effected behind the German lines. I'm quoting the words of Prime Minister Winston Churchill. He's speaking or has spoken in the House of Commons, and the news of what he said is coming over sentence by sentence over our news machines and being brought here as it comes in. Continuing, Mr. Churchill said, the landings on the beaches are proceeding at various points. At the present time, the fire of shore batteries has been largely quelled. And then Mr. Churchill said, obstacles which were constructed in the sea have not proved so difficult as was apprehended. Let me just read to you again those last three sentences that we have. They're very important. They're the latest news of the invasion. Winston Churchill in the House of Commons said, the landings on the beaches are proceeding at various points. The fire of shore batteries has been largely quelled and obstacles which the Germans constructed in the sea have not proved so difficult as was thought before the invasion started. The, there will be more in a few moments on the uh, talk of Prime Minister Churchill in the House of Commons. As it comes in, we shall give it to you, and eventually, when it's all in, we'll give you the whole thing. But now, here at Columbia's News Headquarters, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Ned Calmer of CBS World News, who's been here with us all night. After doing his 11 o'clock broadcast last night, he stayed here through the entire invasion broadcast coverage we've been doing. Mr. Calmer is familiar with that part of the French coast where the reported landing has been made and is, in fact, a former news correspondent of many years' experience in France. Mr. Calmer has been broadcasting to France recently in French for the Office of War Information and is heard regularly on the CBS network. And now here is Ned Calmer. Between bulletins, let's take a geographical look at the developing military situation. As nearly as we know, up to now, our landings have been taking place on the beaches between Le Havre and Cherbourg on the French coast of the Channel. This is not officially stated by Allied headquarters. It's the persistent report of the German radio. Those beaches where we're apparently going in are some of the broadest, smoothest, and finest in the world. And this part of France is perhaps the best-known part of the coast to Americans. In peacetime, thousands of Americans pass through the picturesque port of Le Havre, now reported under bombardment by our warships. Other thousands have visited Deauville and Trouville in the heyday of American tourists' fashionable resorts. Fécon and Dieppe are also ports to watch. These once peaceful sands have now been invaded with all the paraphernalia of war. Ships, guns, tanks, and barbed wire. The bathing beaches have been turned into German strong points. The waters where Americans splashed and frolicked a dozen years ago are now churning with a grimmer sort of activity. However, if you heard the earlier broadcast by CBS correspondent Richard Hottelet, who reported his flight in a Marauder medium bomber, over a section of the Channel Coast, there was little or no op opposition to our landings so far as Hotlet could observe from the plane. So perhaps these beach defenses are not as formidable as the Nazi propagandists have been painting them for many weeks. Along the beaches in the so-called Bay of the Seine, so-called because the Seine empties into the Channel at Le Havre, 
one kind of warfare apparently has been taking place. But on the Normandy Peninsula, where our airborne and parachute troops are reported to have landed, another kind of fighting has been going on. Here, the country is either plateau or low mountain ranges, with cliffs several hundred feet high overlooking the sea. It wouldn't be possible to make effective landings from the water, so our men evidently have been dropped from the air. Of course, just back of this coastal area, France is thickly cultivated and studded with towns and cities. One of the cities which may be an objective is Caen. I'll spell that C-A-E-N, which lies inland about eight miles from this coastal area I've just been describing. Another thing we must take into account, of course, is the effect of our pre-invasion bombing on the many highways, broad and narrow, the complex railway network which links the German secondary defense areas with the coast. One of the tasks of our paratroops surely would be to seize and cut the key highways in this system. And the Norman peasant, the channel fisherman who knows every inch of these roads and every foot of water along the shore, is bound to be of invaluable assistance in our operations. Taking a more general view, an advance started from this area, about 60 miles wide, from the mouth of the Seine to the westward. Such an advance might head for Paris, keeping the Seine on its left flank. On east of the Seine, the coast is much more hazardous, and landings between there and the Somme River would be much more difficult to carry out. I'll turn the microphone back now to Bob Trout. We've been listening to Ned Calmer at Columbia's News Headquarters in New York. A few more additions to the address which Prime Minister Winston Churchill is making in the House of Commons have now come in. Uh, However, I think uh, that as this news is so fresh, as Mr. Churchill is revealing specific details which carry the story of the fighting definitely forward, I think perhaps we should start at the very beginning and uh, go on from there. This is the way the bulletin first came in. London, Prime Minister Churchill told the House of Commons today that an immense uh, Allied armada of 4,000 ships with several thousand smaller boats had carried the Allied forces across the Channel to begin the invasion of Europe. He said that massed airborne landings have been successfully made behind the German lines. And then Mr. Churchill said, the landings on the beaches are proceeding at various points at this time. The fire of shore batteries has been largely quelled. The Prime Minister went on to say, Obstacles which the Germans constructed in the sea have not proved so difficult as was thought before the invasion started. Then the Prime Minister said the American and British allies are sustained by about 11,000 first-line aircraft which can be drawn upon as needed. I'd like to repeat that sentence because in the original copy there was a slight error and the figure came out as 1,000. Actually, that figure is 11,000, and so I'll read the sentence again. The Prime Minister said the American-British allies are sustained by about 11,000 first-line aircraft which can be drawn upon as needed. So far, said Winston Churchill, the commanders who are engaged report that everything is proceeding according to plan. And then Mr. Churchill, who knows well the history of that phrase, said to the House of Commons, and what a plan. Then Mr. Churchill said the vast operation was undoubtedly the most complicated and the most difficult which has ever been made. I believe there's an addition to the uh, uh, story, this running story, of what Prime Minister Churchill is saying at Commons, and uh, here is an addition. We shall furnish the enemy, he said, with a succession of surprises during the course of the fighting. The battle will grow constantly in scale and intensity for many weeks to come. I shall not attempt to speculate upon its course. But, said the Prime Minister, this I may say, that complete unity prevails throughout the Allied armies. There is a brotherhood in arms between us and our friends of the United States. The ardor and spirit of our troops, as I saw for myself, as they were embarking in the last few days, was splendid to witness. And uh, that is is the first news of how the battle is going. That is the story so far of the address which Prime Minister Winston Churchill is making in the House of Commons. Uh, I repeated some of it as I'd already started to give it to you. More of it will be coming in, and we'll give it to you as it comes in. The very last few quotations uh, were the freshest, 
And as all of Mr. Churchill's speech is studded with bits of definite information that we have not had before, I, I think that I should repeat the uh, last edition. Mr. Churchill said, We shall furnish the enemy with a succession of surprises during the course of the fighting. The battle will grow constantly in scale and intensity for many weeks to come. And then Mr. Churchill said, I shall not attempt to speculate upon its course, but this I may say, that complete unity prevails throughout the Allied armies. There is a brotherhood in arms between us and our friends of the United States. The ardor and spirit of our troops, as I saw for myself as they were embarking in the last few days, was splendid to witness. Just had word that Mr. Churchill has indicated that he will announce further news later in the day. This may mean that uh, the speech that Mr. Churchill has been making has uh, now been ended. I should call it a statement, really. It's not a speech, a statement before the House of Commons. Perhaps this means that that statement has ended. Mr. Churchill gave us a good deal of news that we hadn't had before. There's only been one communique issued since uh, the Allied command, the Supreme Command, announced the invasion had started, and that communique was exactly one sentence long. Mr. Churchill's statement in Commons uh, did give us uh, a great many specific details, and they carried the story of the invasion forward a, a great deal. And now the last word we have, just one sentence off the news machine, which says that the Prime Minister indicates he will announce further news later in the day. Needless to say, when he announces it, we shall bring it to you very promptly. Another interesting note, last night in Washington, General George C. Marshall, the Chief of Staff of the United States Army, whose forces now are committed to their very greatest test, declared in a pre-invasion address that the final action in the European war will come in a battle to the death for the Nazis and a battle to victory for the Allies. The confident words of Chief of Staff General Marshall were spoken at a special ceremony at the Soviet Russian Embassy in Washington last night, where he was awarded the Order of Suvorov, one of the highest of all Russian military decorations. An imposing list of dignitaries was puzzled when General Marshall list of dignitaries was puzzled when General Marshall suddenly left the embassy almost immediately after the ceremony without waiting for the customary buffet supper. No one knew exactly why the general had walked out of the ceremony, walked out rather after the ceremony, and walked out on the party which followed it, but the explanation, of course, came a few hours later with the announcement at 3.32 in the morning Eastern wartime that Allied troops were landing in France, the liberation of the continent has begun. A word on German propaganda, of which we shall be hearing a great deal now that the invasion has begun. We shall probably be hearing even more than we have heard these past 10 or 15 years. The uh, battle is going to take some time, according to Mr. Churchill's indications. He said it will go on for weeks before it reaches its climax. I'm only paraphrasing his words, but that's what he said in effect. And now here's a note on the German propaganda, which will be active during those weeks, we may be sure. Columbia shortwave listening station reports that Radio Berlin's first propaganda comment on the invasion was a flat statement that the invasion was undertaken because the orders of Moscow could not be evaded any longer. Our Columbia shortwave listening station recalls that for several months now, the Berlin propagandists have been trying to persuade their enemy audiences that the Allies would be forced to invade Europe because Joseph Stalin demanded an invasion. There's not much sign that anyone took them very seriously, not even in the countries which are friendly to Germany. Other Berlin propaganda so far this morning is just about what you'd expect. German broadcasters are talking about air defenses clicking into action and about German forces launching effective attacks against Allied formations. However, as you may have heard if you've been with us during this night-long broadcast, Allied correspondents who flew over the scene reported few signs of German resistance, so perhaps we can chalk that up as just another German effort to frighten us. And I might remind you that one of the Allied correspondents who flew over the scene and reported no uh, fighter plane opposition at all from the Germans was Columbia's correspondent Richard Hotlett, who was out over the invasion coast in, uh, in an Allied marauder and who returned to broadcast sometime during the night, I've forgotten the time, to broadcast from uh, Supreme Headquarters in London that there had been no German fighter plane resistance, none at all, but there had been light uh, German 
flak. A further note on the uh, running account of the statement by Prime Minister Churchill in the House of Commons just in. Mr. Churchill said in Commons, there already are hopes that tactical surprise has been achieved. And that is, uh, that seems that one sentence seems to be the only thing new to be added to uh, what we have already heard about the statement of Prime Minister Winston Churchill in the House of Commons. There are uh, lots of speeches, there have been lots of speeches and statements made during the course of this night, as you can very well imagine. Perhaps this will be a good point to give you a few excerpts. Uh, General Eisenhower, in his order of the day uh, to his armies, who were then invading Europe, said... Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark on a great crusade. Your task will not be an easy one. We will accept nothing less than full victory. People of Western Europe, the hour of your liberation is approaching. That is an excerpt uh, from the order of the day issued by General Eisenhower to his troops of sea, land, and air as the invasion began. The order of the day was read on all uh, Allied networks from Britain by Columbia's chief correspondent in London, Edward R. Murrow, along around 4 o'clock in the morning New York time, I believe it was. Here's an excerpt from the statement of General John J. Pershing, the commander of the American forces during uh, the First World War. Today, said General Pershing, the sons of American soldiers of 1917-1918 are engaged in a like war of liberation. I have every confidence that they, with their gallant brothers in arms, will win through to victory. Herbert Hoover is in with a quotation. It says, The end of German tyranny is on the way. We have faith in our army. And a quotation been handed, has been handed me from Captain Ludwig Sertorius, who is known as a German military commentator, and who is quoted as saying, The great contest between the Reich and the Anglo-Americans has begun. We can only stress the single-mindedness with which the German Wehrmacht is facing the enemy's onslaught. For in war, ethical values are at least as important as the number of soldiers and the quantity of their equipment. Now, that was a comment from uh, Captain Sertorius. It was just handed me. Uh, but as I uh, recall now, that uh, comment was made before we had word that this really was the invasion. Back in the early hours when we were still... All we could tell you then uh, was that the Germans had been saying the invasion had begun, but whether it really had or not, we did not know. And uh, it might be a good point to remember that uh, as far as we know, there may not be anybody named Captain Ludwig Sartorius. He is uh, he's, uh, really a signature put on between DNB agency and Transocean. I'll repeat that in a moment, but first here's something from DNB. The German DNB agency has reported the fact of the Allied invasion of northern France to the German people at last. DNB has told the German people all about it in a press dispatch which was sent out five hours after the German agencies had begun to issue reports of the operations for foreign consumption. That means us. This fact is reported to us by the Office of War Information, which says the DNB dispatch to the German people began with this sentence. The long-expected British-American attack on the north coast of France started last night. A DNB put out its first invasion dispatch to the European press outside Germany. The German Transocean Agency, which transmits German news propaganda by wireless for overseas consumption in the English language, had also begun to send out invasion reports for overseas consumption about five hours before the DNB domestic dispatch. We've had no word uh, from Russia so far, incidentally. We never know. We might get some word. The Russian offensive, we've all understood, was to be coordinated with the beginning of the Allied uh, invasion of Europe. Of course, coordination does not necessarily mean that the offensive on the Eastern Front would begin at the exact, de the exact time and day that the invasion of the West across the Channel would begin. But everyone does expect that some sort of offensive on the Eastern Front, and probably a gigantic offensive will be coordinated with the invasion across the Channel. We're also waiting, incidentally, as I told you a bit ago, for word from Tokyo. It'll be interesting to see what Tokyo, the uh, Japanese partner of the Germans, has to say about this latest move, the beginning of the liberation of the continent of Europe. 
Prime Minister Winston Churchill in his statement before the House of Commons has given us the latest details about uh, how the fighting is going. He just told the House of Commons a few minutes ago, I was giving you some of it then, he told the House of Commons a few minutes ago that the Allied invasion is going according to plan, and he said to the delighted members of Parliament, what a plan. Mr. Churchill said that during the night a series of landings were made in force along the French coast by more than 4,000 ships together with several thousand smaller boats. And then the Prime Minister said that the massed airborne landing behind the German lines had been successfully made. And he said that 11,000 first-line planes can be drawn upon for the purpose of supporting the land armies. And then he also told us that fire from the shore batteries has been largely overcome. Now, I think this might be a good moment if uh, there are a good many of you, I assume, still tuning in who have still perhaps not even heard that the invasion had started. This might be a good moment to read to you the only communique which has come out of the Supreme Allied Headquarters so far since we got the news that the invasion had begun. That uh, communique is very brief, and here it is. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces supported by strong air forces began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. That communique was read from Supreme Allied Headquarters in Britain. At 32 minutes past 3 o'clock in the morning, Eastern War Time, uh, this morning or last night, as you prefer, the story has been carried beyond that uh, news given in the communique. It's been carried beyond that now by the news which was given us by Prime Minister Winston Churchill in his statement at the House of Commons. But still, that one-sentence communique is historic, and that will always be the one that will be in the history books as the one sentence which announced that finally the liberation of the continent of Europe had begun. I've just given you a few uh, of, the of the details, repeated them rather, uh, from Prime Minister Churchill's statement in the House of Commons, and I might remind you once again that uh, the Prime Minister said uh, he indicated, rather, he did not say, the Prime Minister indicated that he will have further news later in the day. Also, later in the day, we are expecting a broadcast by King George VI of Great Britain, and also we hear there will be a broadcast from General de Gaulle, who now is in London. We're not sure of it, but there very probably will be. In addition, of course, we're getting broadcasts from Britain all the time, uh, broadcasts from our own correspondents and from correspondents who are pooling their news by arrangement in these first days of the invasion. We haven't had any now for a few minutes. There was a time when, uh, during the night, when we were getting these broadcasts from London within 30 seconds of one another, and at any moment now, of course, we might be interrupted to be told that another one is coming up. And as a matter of fact, someone is now coming in with a note to give me. If you will excuse me for a moment, I'll look at it. It is not from London, but it says that we have word now from our Washington News headquarters that an officer of the French general staff is standing by to give us a description of the portions of the French coast which the Germans say we have invaded. So for an introduction and this analysis, we take you now to Washington, Don Pryor reporting. As soon as General Eisenhower's communique confirmed the Allied invasion of northern France, one of the first men in Washington to be notified was Lieutenant Colonel Victor M. Morrison of the French military mission in Washington. He came immediately to the CBS Washington newsroom and has been poring over press service reports. His interest in this morning's news is intensely personal as well as professional. Colonel Morrison. This morning at dawn, after a series of feints, Allied troops landed on the continent. According to the latest German reports, these landings were on the French northwest coast between Cherbourg and Le Havre. The Germans say that the center of gravity of this battle is around Caen. This part of France is very familiar to me since I've spent many summers on the Normandy coast and my wife's family is living in Bayeux, 20 miles north of Caen and only six miles from the coast. North of Le Havre, the beach is composed of high cliffs that are not suitable for a landing. The estuary of the Seine is much lower, as well as all the part of the coast to the north of Caen. Between Caen and the estuary of the Ville, the beaches are composed of high cliffs and low beaches alternately. The estuary of the Ville is very low and looks much like the coast of the Mont Saint-Michel. Between Carentan and Cherbourg, and especially near Carentan, 
The beach can be used easily for landing purposes. Inland, in the Caen region, the country is rather flat and is known as the Plain of Caen. This is an ideal terrain for armoured cars and motorised vehicles. Between Bayeux and Cherbourg, the country is hilly and divided into small fields surrounded by high hedges. These would help the German defenders. The main road in this part of the country runs from Paris to Cherbourg and parallels the coast from Lisieux to Cherbourg. Several roads of less importance link the interior of the country to the small ports along the channel. All this country between Lisieux and Cherbourg is served by only one rail line not far from the Paris-Cherbourg highway.